Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Prevalence of Restraint webinar. We are so pleased that you could join us. My name is Bonnie Zampino. I am the Engagement Specialist at Ukeru Systems. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you know how to best participate in today's event. As you can see, we have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. We are eager for this to be as interactive as possible you will have the opportunity to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will be collecting those and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. In addition, we welcome you to join us throughout this conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag starts with you. I'm very pleased to have with us today Professor Peter Sturmey. Dr. Sturmey is a professor of psychology at the Graduate Center and the Department of Psychology at Queens College, City University of New York, where he is also a member of the Behavior Analysis Doctoral Program. He is an honorary professor of psychology at the Division of Health and Social Care Research at King's College, London. He specializes in autism and other developmental disabilities, especially in the areas of applied behavior analysis, dual diagnosis, evidence-based practice, and staff and parent training. Dr. Sturmey is well published as both author and editor of over 20 publications. He also has countless peer-reviewed papers and book chapters to his name. In addition, he is a prolific national and international speaker and has an active lab of doctoral students working on developing and evaluating effective ways of training caregivers using modeling and feedback to use applied behavior analysis with children and adults with autism and other disabilities. We are so pleased to be able to hear from him today. Welcome, Dr. Sturmey. We're eager to hear what you have to tell us today. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about <coughs> uh, use of restraint and how to uh, reduce it safely. I hope at the uh, end of this you'll see that you often hear calls for reduction of restraint in services. Uh, I've heard such uh, appeals for more than 35 years, um, but very often people don't tell you how to do it. And so I hope in this webinar you'll see some research that can guide your practice and show you some of the various ways you can uh, work with both individuals and organizations to reduce restraint. Uh, so that's an overview of what we will uh, look at. At the end, I'll give you a summary of some guidelines that you can, can use. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the work um, that I'm presenting today comes out of um, probably about 20 or more years of research and practice that I've done, uh, both as a chief psychologist in a couple of developmental centers in Texas some 15 years ago, uh, as well as research with some of my graduate students uh, here in uh, New York. And I summarized this work about uh, two years ago in uh, this book on reducing restraint and other restrictive behavior management practices. So if you want further information, uh, it's all there uh, in, in that book. Uh, next slide. So it's kind of interesting. What are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about restrictive behavior management practices? There are several different things. We're talking about physical restraints, personal restraints, seclusion and uh, locked room timeout, uh, as needed chemical restraints, and various forms of movement restrictions. When you look at the list of the different procedures here, you'll see they're quite varied. 
and uh, some are of more concern than, than others. So although asking somebody to put their hands in their pockets or um, to uh, sit outside the room and keep quiet um, is somewhat restrictive, it stops their, their movement, it's not very unsafe. But when we look at emergency personal restraint, where somebody is taken down on the floor, maybe has a cross chest restraint, or um, even in some situations people restricting uh, movement of the chest by sitting across somebody's uh, chest on the floor, uh, then we get very concerned uh, because of the safety issues and the number of uh, restraint-related deaths that are being reported. So these procedures that you see here vary both in terms of how bad they look and how restrictive they are, but also in terms of their safety as well. Uh, so many services use physical restraints like splints, um, ties to furniture and, and uh, uh, wheelchairs and so forth. There are various type, types of uh, personal restraints that people use. Some services use programmatic uh, locked room timeout and other services use uh, seclusion. So timeout is uh, um, a planned procedure based on the idea that it removes the reinforcer maintaining the dangerous behavior. Whereas seclusion is more of a safety procedure um, that is less planned. And if you look carefully at what some services do, you'll see modified handles and um, people blocking exit using furniture and uh, other things. So there's a whole range of different procedures we're talking about. Next slide. As I was putting together the book, it occurred to me that actually we restrain ourselves and restrain other people quite a lot. We try to stop people moving around with strong reminders. Right? I'm not supposed to park on certain sides of the street in New York and barriers stop us all driving uh, into holes down the road. And we think that's, most of those things are pretty good, right? Many typical children are restrained. We have them tied in strollers and in the back of our cars and in high chairs. And if they've got a, uh, a bad rash or something like scratch themselves, we put mitts on their hands to stop them doing that. In some situations, if you don't restrain your child in the back of the car, it will um, take to court and, and uh, give you a fine to make sure that you do it in the future as well. Uh, and if you don't wear your seat belts, we'll fine you for not restraining yourself in those situations also. Uh, in many medical and dental situations, uh, people use various kind, kinds of ties, bed rails, sedation, and so forth. And in dentistry, people uh, occasionally uh, use uh, mechanical and chemical restraints. And there are even some forms of physical therapy and rehabilitation that involve restriction of people's movement. I came across an interesting example for treatment of stroke. So in constraint-induced movement therapy, when somebody has a, a unilateral stroke, a, a, a legitimate treatment is to restrain, to tie down the unaffected arms and legs, to make the person move their affected uh, arms and legs. And there's evidence that that form of restraint uh, increases the, the rate of recovery from stroke both functionally in terms of how much people can move and also neurologically in terms of um, uh, regrowth of, of uh, neurons. And we also restrain ourselves quite a lot. We put our hands in our pockets or fold our arms and sit up straight and to make sure we don't fidget and we, we tense up when we get a shot to make sure we don't wriggle around. And Skinner talks about this as a, a way of managing our own behavior. And uh, I think my, my mother taught me to uh, hold my hands together and to sit up straight uh, in certain social situations. And so Skinner speculates that we learn to self-restrain because of contingencies of punishment early in life. Uh, we literally bite our tongue and put our hand over our mouth to stop ourselves saying something foolish. So we also restrain ourselves quite a lot. This last example is not exactly facetious because when we look at some examples of self-injury, we may actually uh, think about 
the way some individuals with disabilities restrain themselves to prevent themselves from hurting themselves. And we may teach themselves to restrain themselves uh, in a more appropriate way as well. So there are lots of forms of restraint, most of which we think are okay. Let's look at the next slide. But many of the restraints that we're concerned with today are uh, problematic. Um, restraints stop people learning, they stop people being able to interact with materials and people. They look bad, uh, they're stigmatizing, and if sources are interested in promoting uh, positive images of people with disabilities, um, we wouldn't be using uh, restraints. Um, personal and mechanical restraints uh, have a risk of physical injury. Uh, people, the, the injuries vary tremendously in severity from minor scrapes and bruising and uh, at the most extreme end, uh, restraints can result in death. In 1998, the Hartford Current, uh, a newspaper in Connecticut, reported about 140 restraint-related deaths in the United States. So there are periodic updates related to that. There are a couple of more uh, subtle negative effects of, of restraints. One is that it sounds odd, but the use of restraints may actually reinforce the aggression or self-injury for which we, we use them. And so although we may keep people safe on a temporary basis, we may inadvertently um, reinforce the problem that we're trying to reduce. So for example, if somebody uh, uh, shows self-injury to escape a noisy, crowded environment, they hurt themselves, and we uh, place them in, a, in restraint somewhere quietly, we've also removed them from that aversive environment, thereby reinforcing the self-injury that we hope to reduce. A more subtle um, negative impact of restraints is for individuals with chronic self-injury, when they're placed in uh, chronic restraints, uh, we stop trying. We, the person is not going to hurt themselves immediately, and so some people think it's actually quite a good thing. They're kept safe now, they're not going to hurt themselves. But of course, when you see that with little children, um, the long-term impact is not so clear. But when you see adults who remain in mechanical restraints for self-injury for decades or almost all of their lives, you see the tremendous negative impact that um, uh, restraints can have. Because in that example, once the person is restrained, there's no aversive stimulus for the caregivers. And so we don't try as hard as we might to treat the underlying self-injury and uh, reduce the use of restraint. So those are some of the, the undesirable effects of restraints. Uh, let's look at the next slide, please. Okay, people have been concerned for restraints. In fact, going back to the 19th century, um, one of the early asylum movements in the 1840s was to uh, reduce and eliminate mechanical restraints. So this is actually nothing very new. But what we see is that the uh, legal and professional uh, standards of conduct keep on changing and vary substantially uh, from one set of standards to another. So within a particular state or a particular state agency or a particular organization such as a school or a not-for-profit residential services, you may have rather different uh, rules and regulations uh, which may even contradict each other uh, within the same setting. You may have uh, agencies that are governed by school regulations, child residential regulations, adult rehab regulations, and adult residential regulations. So there are often multiple regulations out there that we have to get our heads around. And you should be familiar with the um, current regulations of the agencies you work for, and state agencies and the state laws where you work. As an example of the, the contrast uh, in professional standards, Applied Behaviour Analysis Inter International uh, issued standards that says, in general terms, um, 
the most important focus where we're using restraints is the uh, welfare of the individual. Um, that individuals, including parents, get to choose um, uh, the treatment methods, and that we should use the principle of least restrictive uh, intervention, going from least to most restrictive intervention. And the ABBA I standards also include uh, strong regulation in terms of having uh, really uh, truly implemented behavior support plans and functional behavior assessments. Uh, strong requirements for uh, staff training and supervision and evaluation of ongoing um, treatment plans for individuals who are restrained. If you stick to those guidelines, I think they're, they're excellent and they really um, help you do a good job of uh, providing the best services for individuals who are restrained. Um, what's interesting is some people see that last one, the principle of least restrictiveness, as being the back door to permit the use of restraint. You can contrast those standards with um, TASH. TASH is an advocacy organization that uh, advocates only for use of positive supports and uh, opposes all use of restraint. And TASH has been advocating at the federal and state legislative level to uh, eliminate all use of restraints and restrictive procedures. And they've had some success at the state level in certain states to um, uh, ban different forms of, of restraint. Right now, uh, there's no federal law that bans the use of restraints in services. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Arnie Duncan, uh, who headed up the Department of Education, went directly asked, does IDEA ban the use of restraints? The answer was, no, it doesn't. So that's kind of an interesting uh, range of perspectives on the use of restraints. I think the message for practitioners is you've got to keep up to date and um, uh, monitor how things are changing in your own state, your own place where you work, and your um, uh, the, 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 your, own, your own profession. Okay, next slide. So the second part of the presentation, I, I want to suggest that applied behavior analysis has some uh, unique uh, procedures to uh, reduce restraint and other restrictive behavior management practices uh, safely. And the obvious thing to do is to effectively treat the aggression, self-injury, and other target behaviors that occasion the use of restraint. Evidence-based practice to reduce the target behaviors should eliminate the, the use of restraint. And there are many research papers and many practitioners who can attest to that. A second thing that applied behavior analysis has to offer is evidence-based approaches to staff training and supervision. And then finally, applied behavior analysis has some specific um, interventions related to restraint. Interventions based on the functions of the target behavior, restraint fading procedures, and other procedures that we'll take a look at in a minute. So let's begin uh, with the next slide. So, um, there are multiple reviews out there of evidence-based practice uh, for the kinds of target behaviors that occasion restraint. And they pretty much agree on uh, what things seem to work. And I published a book with uh, a colleague, Robert Didden, a couple of years ago on this topic. And last year, uh, Nirvay Singh edited a large handbook on this topic. And broadly speaking, uh, whether they're talking about self-injury, aggression, tantrums, and so on, um, there's broad agreement uh, that certain things seem to be robustly effective. The first is that treatments that are based on functional assessment are more likely to produce larger reductions in the problem behavior and more likely to increase communication and other adaptive responses. So knowing what the contingencies of reinforcement are for aggression and self-injury uh, will guide us to the treatments that are most effective and will guide us to avoid the treatments that are harmful. So for example, a functional assessment might tell us whether uh, aggression is maintained by attention, snacks, uh, leisure items as reinforcers, uh, whether it's reinforced by avoidance of unpleasant things like uh, academic demands, engaging adapt, uh, 
uh, ADLs or uh, escaping from noisy crowded rooms, uh, whether it's uh, reinforced by self-stimulation or whether it's reinforced by uh, reduction of pain or other internal discomfort. Knowing the functions, those four functions of aggression will tell us the treatments to use and the treatments not to use. In addition, um, certain procedures seem to be effective. Uh, can you just go back a step, please? Okay, forward one. Can you go to, thank you. So one treatment which is uh, effective is combining extinction with either differential reinforcement, such as reinforcing a communication response and removing the reinforcer for uh, target behavior, or combining extinction with some form of punishment, for example, uh, loss of privileges or loss of points in a token system. Uh, use of extinction alone is undesirable um, because it takes longer to work and might be potentially dangerous. Um, and we have other combined treatments uh, which are likely to be more effective and more acceptable. So typically, you'll combine extinction with reinforcement of other behavior. Probably the most acceptable uh, intervention for the behaviors that cause restraint is functional communication training. I mentioned, for example, uh, the function of uh, aggression for some people might be to, for example, obtain uh, preferred items like uh, uh, music or snacks. Well, functional communication training means identifying what those things are that the person is asking for and teaching them an acceptable way to point to or ask or use a communication device to obtain those items. So that's a second uh, uh, evidence-based practice that can be very helpful. A third one is so-called non-contingent reinforcement. Delivering the reinforcer that's maintaining the problem behavior independent of the person's behavior. For example, um, giving a person a break every 20 minutes. Uh, and finally, we can modify antecedents. For example, um, uh, removing demands and gradually reintroducing them would be an example of uh, modifying antecedents. Uh, to find out more about these methods, you should talk with a, a board certified behavior analyst or experienced uh, other professional in this area. Okay, uh, slide 14. Okay, a uh, second component that um, behavior analysis has to offer is to prevent the problem by teaching skills, uh, having a structured environment, having high rates of positive reinforcement, choice making, and reducing instructions and nagging people and other aversive stimulation. Getting people to be as independent as possible in an environment with lots of choices and lots of positive reinforcement is a good way to prevent. If you're going to have to intervene for the target behavior, uh, you should also have a consequence for the alternate behavior that is, for example, reinforcing the communication response and a correct consequence to the target behavior, for example, uh, removing the reinforcer, maintaining that response. Okay, next slide. When it comes to training staff, it's important to use evidence-based practices. And talking to people and giving them lectures is a robustly ineffective way to do that. The things that seem to work are showing people what to do, modeling, getting them to practice, rehearsal, and giving them feedback. And so when training staff members in either prevention or uh, how to respond to target behaviors, we shouldn't talk to them very much. We should um, uh, show them what to do, observe them practice, and uh, give them feedback until they reach some predetermined criterion of mastery. And we should also program generalization of staff behavior, practicing prevention strategies with different people, with different clients in different settings is going to make your training much more uh, effective. And if we design uh, role plays and scripted practice uh, to address different situations, we can make our training more effective. Uh, finally, uh, service settings and state organizations need to have a clear system of training. There should be clear priorities 
to address basic skills like interaction skills, choice making, and the training should be pushed down the hierarchy of the organization so that local supervisors, teachers, shift supervisors, and so on, are the people delivering the training. It gets the message through to the, to the people that supervisors are largely responsible for training their own staff and that uh, we shouldn't be hanging around. And he also has the advantage of giving people a larger number uh, of trainers available. So that's a systems aspect which people should be working on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's an example of the kinds of uh, studies we're talking about. And this is for people who have uh, very severe uh, aggression and anger. These are individuals with mild disabilities in a forensic setting. We identified triggers that set the occasion uh, for their aggression, like uh, a bus trip being cancelled or the music therapist being cancelled. And we deliberately presented the triggers for aggressive behavior. This might seem strange at first. One of the reasons we did this is to give the individuals the opportunities to practice doing something else. Uh, in addition, we trained these individuals to do something different uh, when these um, triggers for aggression occurred. So, for example, um, if somebody teased the person, we would practice in a, uh, a group setting uh, how to deal with teasing, to ask the person to stop, and if that didn't work, to go get a staff member to help them. And so we would practice that in a group setting, uh, in role play, and the individual would have to keep practicing until they got it right a certain number of times. And we practice uh, those skills, and we had a second trigger that would be used for generalization. So for example, if somebody got mad because they uh, uh, lost their yogurt for breakfast, we train them on that, to have to deal with that situation. But then we might train, uh, look for generalization, what happened if they couldn't have dessert, for example. Okay, next slide. So in this graphic, you'll see uh, data for three individuals. I'm just going to talk about the top one here, Mr. Longley. In the baseline here, you'll see that the uh, aggression occurred in about 60% of the occasions when uh, the triggers were presented. And in uh, the dark symbols is when they um, showed the replacement behavior, the correct response to when something bad went wrong. At the, at the dashed line, we provided the training. Most of these people could be trained in between one to five sessions. And we see after training in the natural environment, you'll see here there's high rates of the replacement behavior, the communication response, and the aggressive behavior reduced dramatically and continued to reduce. And we have broadly similar uh, outcomes for the other two individuals as well. And we also have data showing uh, increased numbers of community trips because the staff and family members uh, felt comfortable in taking these individuals out. So that's an example of evidence-based practice to reduce the target behavior that would often occasion the use of restraint. Next slide. Okay, so as well as effective treatment, we can start to think about how restraints might uh, help us understand the problem behavior that we're trying to, to treat. It's always tempting to assume that restraint must be uh, positive punisher. It looks uncomfortable to have a takedown or to be put in a straitjacket. But surprisingly, that's not necessarily the case. For example, you may see uh, some individuals with chronic self-injury who, when you take them out of their long-term restraints, will reach for the restraint devices, look at them, grab them, and if they talk, will ask for the restraint devices. This all suggests that sometimes restraint devices actually function as positive reinforcers. It sounds odd, but after a while that actually makes sense. Another function for restraints is it may be associated with the removal of aversive stimuli. If you're teaching somebody an activity of daily living, they become agitated and you hold their arms down You've done two things. You've held their arms down, but you've also removed the request 
And so removing that request may inadvertently uh, reward the, uh, the agitation. Uh, third, there are some papers showing that restraints do function as a positive punisher. They reduce the target behavior to which they're applied. And there are a bunch of papers published in the 1970s and 80s suggesting and showing that sometimes restraint is an effective way to reduce target behavior. And finally, um, restraints and other restrictive behavior management practices uh, may result in the loss of reinforcers, like moving around, interacting with people. It can kind of be a, a form of time out from positive reinforcement. So the message from this slide is that we don't know exactly how restraints might function, but they could function in several different ways. Uh, next slide, please. Dr. Sturming, just to let you know, you're breaking up a little bit on this last slide, so I'm, I'm not sure if you've changed position or not, but just, just to let you know, there was a little bit of an audio glitch. Okay, is this better? Seems to be, yes. I'll, I'll let you know if it okay. continues. Okay, so um, the classic treatment papers uh, using restraint as a reinforcer come from people like Judy Favel and Richard Fox, and these people have shown that by rewarding the absence of self-injury or rewarding incompatible behavior like um, holding your hands together or reinfor reinforcing other behaviors like engaging in uh, uh, academic uh, tasks, the restraint can actually be used as a reinforcer for some individuals. And over time, as you expand the interval um, for which uh, restraint is used, eventually the amount of time that the person is in restraint reduces substantially. In the case of the paper by Fox and Dufresne, um, they're able to eliminate restraint completely for an individual with very severe self-injury. Uh, next slide. There are other ways of fading out restraint. So these are antecedent procedures, changing what happens before the self-injury. So people have looked at um, cutting up um, arm splits, gradually removing the metal stays in arm splints, uh, using water wings and reducing the pressure in them, or modifying uh, clothing to uh, gradually reduce the restriction that the person experiences. So behavior analysis has a range of um, restraint fading procedures for self-injury. Next slide. Um, let's go to the next slide, 12, please. 22. OK. Uh, recently, people have looked at what they call rapid restraint analysis, um, where they will put uh, arm splints on people and systematically uh, manipulate how much restraint is applied either no restraints, just the, the canvas uh, cover, uh, once one metal stay or multiple metal stays. And they will observe both the self-injury, uh, the occasional use of restraint, and some adaptive behavior like eating. Look at the next uh, slide. Here we have data from eight individuals. And I'm just going to show, discuss this one here for the top. The uh, dark bars are uh, self-injury, and the open bars are adaptive behavior like spoon feeding. In this situation here for this individual, when they have no restraints, they do engage in adaptive behavior, but they also engage in high rates of restraint, of self-injury. When uh, the, their arms are covered, and there's um, uh, just one thin splint in there, they can still flex their arms and spoon feed, but they don't self-injure. And for the more intrusive degrees of restraint, they don't self-injure, but they don't engage in an active behavior either. So in this uh, individual, they chose this value of restraint to kickstart restraint fading because it kept the person safe, there's no self-injury, but they could still spoon feed. So this is an empirical method for determining the uh, safe degree of restraint that also allows the person to engage in adaptive behavior. And that could be useful for people with uh, chronic self-injury. It's a way to start 
treatment, not necessarily a way to, to, to end treatment, because it's a way to kickstart treatment. Next slide. Okay, so we don't want to use restraints uh, because they're undesirable, stigmatizing, and often dangerous, and yet they're widely used. Um, there are still surveys done in American education settings showing that, for example, special ed use is restraint and time out and seclusion very, very commonly. But the three strategies I described can be helpful in preventing aggression and self-injury, training staff effectively using modeling and feedback, and various restraint-specific procedures uh, to uh, safely eliminate their use. Let's look at the next slide. Now, the, what I just spoke about mostly related to individuals, but in fact, very often, uh, people are interested in uh, reducing restraint across an entire organization. Let's look at the next slide. Here are some data which are very typical. Across here, um, we have the uh, individuals in a day-have setting, uh, rank ordered from the individual with the most restraint, to individuals who are not restrained. And here we have the number of restraints they have. And in the top panel, you see the top six or eight individuals account for almost all of the restraint in the entire um, service. And these data are typical. You'll find that restraint is very concentrated in a few people. So that's good news because you can focus your efforts on certain individuals and often certain settings. Uh, next slide. Um, here's some other data showing correlates of the use of uh, restraint in this setting. Restraints were most likely to happen during transitions and during seat work. So this is very simple uh, data taken from uh, incident reports. And it was useful to guide some very simple staff training. Uh, training staff on how to handle transitions appropriately and training staff members how to give breaks to the individual so they don't get bored or uncomfortable when they remain in seats for an extended period of time. So that can be useful as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, I want to toot the horn of uh, Eukera here. Uh, this is a uh, paper from uh, Kim Saunders from nearly 10 years ago now on restraint reduction in a relatively large um, service uh, for over 100 individuals, children and adults. And you'll see here it's a pretty typical uh, contemporary uh, uh, community service. Uh, let's look at the next slide. What she did is something very similar to the things that people did in, in the 19th century. Uh, she had a plan, she measured the use of restraints, she set goals, and she gave the staff something else to do instead of restrain the individuals, different prevention strategies and different alternatives to restraint. Um, the program include, uh, involved a lot of staff training, not a uh, one-self staff training at the beginning uh, of uh, the project, but ongoing staff training throughout the project for several years. Additionally, she got the supervisors and managers out of their offices and into the program areas to go and observe what was going wrong and to give help to the staff members. And finally, she monitored the outcomes using a graphs and using the restraint data that her agency co collected. Uh, next slide. So, here are the, the rates of restraint in this organization. Before they started, they had about 10 restraints per 50,000 client days. Um, don't worry about the 50,000 client days, just focus on the numbers for now, the, these numbers here. Within a year of doing the um, uh, restraint reduction program, restraints went down by about 75% in just 12 months. And by the end of the three year period, restraints were close to being eliminated and were nearly reduced by 99%. And whenever I present these data, I'm often asked, they must have had lots of staff and lots of extra resources and lots of extra money, and uh, that's not true. Uh, they just did a rather a lot of work over an extended period of time to make this happen. So they reduced restraint, so that's one good thing. 
But let's see the next slide, please. In addition, the uh, staff injuries reduced. It's a common concern from staff members, supervisors, and unions that if we reduce restraint, people are going to get hurt. These data show that's not the case. In fact, uh, client-related injuries dropped by 40% during the three-year period of the program. I think this reflects that when you train staff well in alternatives to restraint, they are actually less likely to be injured, not more likely. Next slide. And if you don't care about anything else, if you just care about money, here's a good reason to reduce restraints. So um, uh, she also calculated uh, lost staff time, uh, workman's comp costs, and so on. And you see in the first year, um, the cost related to uh, restraint-related injuries to staff dropped by about 45% and reduced by nearly 90%. Uh, over 90% in the fourth year. So those are two measures suggesting that not only did restraint reduce, but safety was improved and money was saved through restraint reduction. Next slide. <clears throat> there are a number of other studies like this using um, group uh, interventions. Here's a study from a large institution published a few years ago, and this is in a uh, institution for nearly uh, over, over 900 individuals and they had broadly similar methods of intervention, data tracking, staff training, oversight and also a requirement that if you restrain clients then you have to design and implement a behavior support plan. There was some additional cost applied to the staff members and professionals that if they're going to restrain they had to put in some effort. Next slide. So here are data over a period of nearly 18 months, and you'll see that the, during the intervention, the rates of restraints reduced dramatically uh, by about 85%. And this is correlated with the increased use of behavior support plans. So here's some further evidence that you can reduce restraint over an extended period of time um, for a large group of clients. Next slide. In this study, um, you'll see that uh, they worked in a community setting for, to eliminate the use of uh, time out. And what they did is they um, identified individuals with high rates of restraint, uh, high rates of time out. Um, they did eliminate 15 out of the 50 people, to 11, who were thought to be too dangerous for the program but they then tried eliminating the time out for two to four individuals uh, each month staggered over a 12 month period. And they found that time out could be eliminated in 92% or 36 out of 39 individuals. Uh, in 62% of the cases, eliminating the uh, time out had uh, no effect on the target behavior, it didn't work. So there's no point in using it. In 38% uh, of the individuals, um, timeout could be eliminated, and there was a minor increase in the target behavior, which could be addressed by simple uh, modifications, like better use of reinforcement. And there are only three individuals in which um, uh, timeout could not be safely uh, eliminated. OK, uh, next slide. I want to jump to the slide after this, please. So here we have the data averaged across all of the uh, 34 individuals. You'll see here, before the program, the use of restraint was increasing, in fact. But when the phased timeout procedure was introduced, uh, timeout could be greatly reduced for a large group of individuals in this community service. So the message for this study is straightforward. Try and eliminate the procedure and see what happens. It may not be that dangerous. It may not be uh, that uh, problematic uh, if you try it. If it is problematic, you might be able to fix uh, the mild increase in uh, target behavior through minor modifications uh, to the treatment program. OK, next slide. <clears throat> so the last treatment study here today 
is more new agey and less behavior analytic at first uh, glance anyway. This is a paper published this year by Nirbay Singh in a uh, facility for 48 uh, individuals in six homes. And he taught the staff members uh, mindful-based positive behavior support. And mindfulness is something that includes uh, adopting relaxed posture by the staff, using diaphragmatic breathing, pay, uh, paying your attention to breathing, uh, practicing meditation and relaxation, uh, learning about uh, Buddhist practice to do with um, uh, meditation, focusing on the presence and uh, present and not being angry uh, and so on. At the end of the seven day training, which took place over a month, um, they would then plan what to do for the rest of the year. So it's a long term uh, study. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so these are the individuals. There are about um, 30 uh, seven or 38 staff members in the treatment and the control group and 24 individuals with disabilities. Uh, most of the individuals with disabilities have severe and profound intellectual disabilities and most took psychotropic medications. Uh, most have plans for aggressive behavior. So a fairly typical uh, population for a more restrictive setting. Uh, next slide please. So here are the interesting data. In the group that received where the staff were trained in mindfulness, restraints reduced from a median of eight per week to close to zero. The uh, individuals who had treatment as usual really had no significant change in the use of restraints. Next slide. In addition, um, the mindfulness training almost eliminated the use of PRM medications. So here you see that there were about six PRNs per week uh, in baseline and hardly any uh, post-training in the mindfulness group and no real change in the treatment as usual group. Next slide. And here we, we look at the elimination of one-to-one -one staffing as well. So here again we see the, the contribution of behavior analysis not only in eliminating restricted behavior management practices, but also in uh, reducing service costs. So one-to-one -one staffing were almost completely eliminated in the experimental group, but not the uh, treatment as usual group. Next slide. Okay. So to summarize this uh, last part of the presentation, I've got about 13 studies now from different people in different settings, um, using a, a range of very different uh, kinds of interventions, some very behavioral, uh, some intuitive, some based on mindfulness. And these papers reduce, uh, produce a large reduction and sometimes almost elimination of restraint over a meaningful time period, some of them reporting restraint reduction up to seven years. So what, what should you make of this as a practitioner? Well, what you can make of this is it, you can do it. It is possible to um, nearly eliminate restraint uh, on a service-wide basis. Um, it's a lot of work, it requires a lot of persistence, it involves dealing with a lot of staff issues and staff training, but it can be done. Um, so that's uh, some good news, that if you work on this hard, and I've done this with a number of different organizations over time, um, that we can actually uh, do this and keep people safe. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you want to reduce restraint, this is what you have to do. You've got to collect honest, accurate, and complete uh, data collection. Don't cheat. Uh, don't tell me that the, uh, the timeout door was slightly open, so it's not really a timeout. Um, have honest, complete data collection. And it almost always involves setting goals that are measurable and feedback to staff and administrators. So saying that you're going to reduce restraint as much as possible by the end of 2017 is not a good goal. But if you say we're going to reduce restraint by 50% by July the 31st, 2017, that's a good measurable goal. It's one that you can fail at. And that is helpful in motivating yourself towards doing this. Almost all these papers involve a lot of staff training, not a one-off event, 
but continuous uh, repetitive staff training and orientation, repeatedly for staff working on the job, and focused staff training for where you've got specific problems. Many of the papers uh, that I have um, can reduce restraint by 75 to 90 percent uh, in between 6 to 12 months. And so it's possible to have large, rapid reductions in restraint. And sometimes this can be maintained for many years. Uh, I hope you find that a provocative uh, set of findings. And I think I'll stop there and uh, ask if there are any questions or comments that we can consider. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Sturmey. That was fascinating, rich information, and we appreciate you sharing it. We do have a few questions, sure. um, if I can share those with you. Um, one is asking if you could expand on the concept of restraints as an antecedent. Oh, okay. Um, so one thing about there is individuals with severe self-injury where when you um, have the restraint device on the person, either a helmet on their head or a mechanical restraints on their arm, they often remain very, very calm. So we think of that as like a signal uh, not to, not to self-injure. Um, when you take the helmet off or the uh, mechanical restraint, the person becomes agitated quickly and often engages in, in self-injury. So the absence of the restraint device is like a, a green light to engage in the self-injury. So when we deal with that situation, one option is to modify the antecedents, the, the, the mechanical restraints. And the ways that people have done that is to gradually loosen the restraints to reduce the pressure, uh, to cut pieces off the restraint devices, to replace um, firm metal stays, which are very stiff, with fewer metal stays and eventually eliminating the metal stays. So that's an example of the restraints as being an antecedent, something that happens before the person self-injures. Thank you so much. Um, another question, and uh, participants on the phone call are welcome to send questions in using the question pane on the control panel. Um, another question that we received asks, if you have any studies that involve reducing restraint in a public school setting? Okay, that's a good question. There are not so many of those uh, out there, uh, which is very surprising because um, a couple of years ago, uh, National Public Radio and um, ProPublica, the uh, a journalist organization, um, uh, got hold of the information from the U.S. Department of Education showing that restraints are widely used in public schools, especially in special ed and in juvenile justice facilities as well. There are a couple of people uh, working who have reported book chapters on um, reductions of restraint in special education. Um, there's somebody up in upstate New York who's doing that. Um, but the procedures are basically the, the same. There's really nothing specific uh, about special education um, that would change how you address the problem. So the, the, the general principles I just described would apply to special ed just, just as well. Thank you so much for answering that question. Another question that's come in um, are, what are some of the most effective positive and negative reinforcement strategies to present, prevent the need for restraint? Oh, okay, great. Um, so in terms of how to use uh, reinforcement, you've got at least two kinds of strategies. Um, very often people intuitively think, oh, you know, this person likes this toy or they like soda, so we'll use that. And um, people's opinions, even family members and staff members who know the individual very well, um, unfortunately sometimes get it wrong. And it's kind of a hit and miss procedure asking people's opinions. So the best way to identify potential reinforcers is to use a, a preference assessment. So go get the items, uh, different toys, different uh, things a person might like, different snacks or drinks, put them on a tray, to see which items the person approaches 
and which ones they avoid. So those preference assessment methods uh, are very helpful in identifying uh, reinforcers for people. Um, the second way is to use information from the functional behavior assessment. When we do a functional behavior assessment, and let's suppose we find out that um, an individual shows a lot of uh, complaining and aggressive behavior in order to access comfort from a preferred staff member. We can put that into the uh, functional behavior assessment, but we can also that's also told us something very important, which is access to detention from that staff member is a very powerful reinforcer. So we could build that into the prevention strategies in two ways. We could use non-contingent reinforcement, always go and talk to Mary for five minutes throughout the day, every 30 minutes, um, or we can use a contingent procedure hand over a picture of Mary, and you go have a, a, a chat with her for five minutes. So uh, that would be the second strategy to identify uh, positive reinforcers for um, uh, prevention strategies, using preference assessments and the results of the functional behavior assessment. Thank you so much. We have time for a few more, and several great questions have come in. Okay. Um, so just taking them in the order that they have come in, um, can you explain the comparison of the use of restraints and other interventions like PRNs, one-to-one, -one, or timeouts? Do you view the latter as negative interventions? Sorry, what, what, what was the list again? Restraints, PRNs? So comparison of the use of restraints and other interventions like PRNs, one-to-one, -one, or timeouts. Um, well, all of them are undesirable because they're stigmatizing and, and they show that you're doing something restrictive um, where um, prevention strategies have failed. And very often when I see these procedures used, I go look, you know, has there been an adequate functional behavior assessment? Is there an adequate behavior intervention plan? Are the staff or family members well trained? Uh, has the person learned a communication response to compete? with the target behavior, the answer is usually no to all those questions. So, I mean, I view those kinds of restrictive uh, practices as all being an indication that, that something is missing from the person's uh, service plan. So, in, in one sense, they're all equally bad in, in that sense. They, they indicate a, a failure of alternate strategies. But in another sense, um, they're not the same, uh, in, and that's in terms of safety. So there's fairly good evidence that emergency restraints are more dangerous than planned restraints. So if you have to use uh, emergency restraints with untrained staff, that's more likely to result in injuries. But even more importantly than that is that there's uh, some evidence that the, uh, the personal and mechanical restraints that involve restrictions across the chest and restrictions in breathing are the most dangerous things. So one-on-one -on -one staffing looks bad, but it probably is not going to kill you. But emergency cross-chest restraints are um, probably very dangerous. And so uh, there's a difference there, which you really should be working hard to ensure that the emergency use of restraints involving restrictions across the chest should not be used um, uh, at all. So that's where you should, in that sense, they're not the same at all. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask one more quick question, and then the okay. other questions that have not been answered, I will um, address those folks <clears throat> individually. Um, so a quick question is um, the mindfulness-based training yeah. that was taught to staff where can that information be found um, if someone else wants to look at training staff on that mindful? Sure. Um, the, the best person for that is, is Nirbay Singh. Uh, he has an organization called the One Institute. And you can go uh, Google that. And uh, if you um, contact him, he also has a manual uh, for training people on mindfulness. So it's not uh, you know, some kind of like airy-fairy, unclear procedure. It's, it's basically a set seven-day class that you can you teach. And he has that manualized. Um, 
if you just Google Nervay Singh, you'll get his email pretty quickly. And um, if, you, if you can't find it, ask one of your psychologists or your behavior analysts to go into Google Scholar and find his email. Um, so it's, it, that's, that's pretty easily available. Is it the one, T H E O N E Institute? I, I think so. I think it's the one institute, I think. Okay, so if folks are asking for the spelling of that institute, or maybe okay. the name of the individual. Yeah, um, nobody saying so. It's S I N J. It's, it's it's in the uh, PowerPoint slides. In I the just... PowerPoint. Excellent, excellent. There were a couple other questions, and um, for those folks um, who didn't get to get their questions answered, we will follow up with you uh, privately. And just to be sensitive to everyone's busy schedule, we really are at the conclusion of our time together. We just wanted to thank you so much, Dr. Sturmey, for being with us today. And we wanted to thank everyone who joined us in this discussion. Uh, we always hope that this is not the end of the dialogue about uh, the prevalence of restraint and how to reduce or eliminate the use of restrictive practices. Uh, to stay in touch, be sure to follow at Ukeru Systems on Twitter uh, using the hashtag starts with you. Also be sure to sign up for our newsletter which you can do on our website at www.ukerusystems.com. If you have any other questions feel free to contact me directly. My email should be showing on that slide. And on behalf of Ukeru Systems and our presenter, we'd like to thank you all once again for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of the day. Okay. Thank you very much for organizing this and thank you for attending. <laughs>